perfection. It was something Roy Holiday achieved one evening in late May of 2010, as not a single Florida Marlin reached base in a game he pitched for the Philadelphia Phillies. It is an achievement so rare that in the 134 years that the major leagues had existed at the time, this was only the 20th perfect game that had ever happened. He was the epitome of what a perfect pitcher should look like. But perfection can also be a burden. Even Roy couldn't <laughs> hold up to the standard that he set for himself. An unobtainable goal where you feel compelled to work extra hard to please everyone around you. I, I don't think there's such a thing as perfect. Perfection was the goal that Roy Halladay was taught to chase ever since childhood in Arvada, Colorado, just outside of Denver. Roy's father bought a home with a 70-foot basement, where he put a pitching mound and a batting cage. Throughout his childhood, his father conditioned Roy to engage in three to four hour workouts in the basement, which included practicing throwing a baseball through a tire hanging from the ceiling. And when Roy's father, who was a pilot by trade, was away from home, he would mark weights with a chalk line and put a hat on exercise equipment just to make sure that Roy was working out while he was gone. Whether the older Halliday pushed his son too hard, too young, well, that's a subject that still divides the Halliday family. As a professional, Roy's work ethic impressed his teammates. That morning he came, he dug right in with his legendary workout in his routine. His Phillies teammates described the first day of workouts when he arrived for spring training in Clearwater. It was 5.45 in the morning, the sun wasn't out yet, assuming we would be the first people here. I was definitely wrong. Roy was, was sitting at the, the table, almost finished with a, a huge breakfast, and he had his workout clothes on, but they were, they were soaking wet. So I said, hey, uh, Roy, did, uh, did, was it raining when you, when you walked in this morning? He kind of let out a chuckle, stood up, put out his hand, said, no, I just, just finished my workout. He worked hard because being perfect meant you had to achieve. As you all know, Roy Halliday does not like to lose. Roy had a strong drive to please others. It meant so much to him that people were proud. At times, it also meant nervousness and embarrassment when he did not live up to his own impossibly high standards. When the Blue Jays sent Roy down to single A after two seasons in the majors to work on his delivery style because his overhand style was giving hitters an advantage, something reflected in his ERA, which had ballooned the 10.64, Roy convinced Brandy to move to Florida so he could avoid facing the people he knew back in Colorado. But by working hard, Roy earned his second chance in the majors, and he made the most of it. Despite his personal demons, he was an inspiration to those who knew him. He was a professional, he was a gentleman, and he was a true athlete throughout his entire career. Even when he wasn't on the mound, he took his preparations very seriously. Days when he wasn't pitching, he sat in the dugout, studied the game, and pulled for his teammates. When he joined the Phillies as an accomplished veteran, he took the time to make his teammates better. I'm very fortunate to be able to call Roy a teammate and a friend, but especially a mentor. He was unselfish even about his own achievements. Many tell the story of how he graciously shared credit for his perfect game with all of his teammates. He saw his perfect game as our perfect game. To celebrate his uh, May the 29th game, he presented 60 personalized luxury watches to one each to each person in the clubhouse. The presentation box read, we did it together. In the end, Roy Halliday may not have been a perfect person. But with hard work, humility, and dedication, imperfect people can still have perfect moments. But Roy Halladay is a proud part of Philly's history. He was awe-striking. He was beautiful inside and out. 
In this video, we are going to look at Roy Halladay's perfect game from the perspective of where it fits in the broad context of Philly's history, just how hard such perfection is to achieve, and why Roy Halladay still holds a special place in the hearts of Phillies fans. Welcome to Philadelphia Baseball History. Don't forget to check out our merchandise. T-shirts, phone cases, masks, notebooks, mugs, and much more. Just go to tpublic.com and look for Philadelphia baseball history. An athlete's finest moments come, not just when he or she can dominate others in his or her sport, they come when an athlete is pushed to rise to the level of his or her competition. And that is probably the most significant meaning to come out of Roy Halladay's perfect game. On May 29, 2010, the Phillies were in the middle of a three-game series with the Florida Marlins, a team that had always seemed to play the Phillies hard. As of the time of this recording, the Phillies' overall record against the Marlins is just above 500 at 543. Playing in South Florida, the Phillies have a losing record, a mere 472 winning percentage. In the first three years of the Phillies' five-year run as National League East champions, the Phillies' record against the Marlins was 9-9, 8-10, and 9-9. So even though the Phillies began the day in first place and the Marlins in fifth, the Phillies could not expect this to be a cakewalk. In fact, Halliday's opponent that day was Josh Johnson. Johnson was the Marlins' ace. He was coming off his first All-Star season in 2009, and Johnson would push well enough in 2010 to make his second All-Star team. Going into the game, the 26-year-old's record was 5-1 with a 2.43 ERA. Halliday faced a formidable opponent, and it would show throughout the game in Florida's Sun Life Stadium. Roy Halliday was coming off of a tough loss to the Boston Red Sox. Through five and two-thirds innings, Halliday had given up eight hits and six earned runs. Nonetheless, even after that May 23rd game, Roy Halliday's ERA was 2.22. His record was six and three. The game started out somewhat uneventful for the Phillies. Wilson Valdez had reached second base on a double in the first inning. But he was stranded as the heart of the order, Chase Utley and Ryan Howard, were unable to drive him home. And while we think of Roy Halladay as being perfect that day, he struggled in the first inning. The first batter, Chris Coughlin, worked a full count. And when he was rung up on a called strike three, Coughlin appeared genuinely surprised. He had begun to walk towards first base, thinking Halliday had thrown ball four. On the outside corner, called strike three. Coughlin, I think, knew it. He was just hoping that the home plate umpire, Mike DeMuro, would give him a pass. It's interesting to compare how Phillies commentator Chris Wheeler saw the pitch. Coughlin tosses the bat away because he thinks he has a walk. Carlos did a nice job of freezing that. As opposed to the Marlins commentator, former Philly himself, Tommy Hutton. Well, you know what, when you're Roy Halladay, you're gonna get this call and you have to be ready for it. It's pitch six, so clearly off the plate. It is somewhat fascinating that Roy Halladay's perfect game could have easily been derailed by the first batter he faced had the home plate umpire not seen that last pitch the way he did. It goes to show just how precarious a perfect game can be, at times dependent on the call of a single pitch. The next batter, Gabby Sanchez, reached a count of two balls and two strikes and fouled off two pitches. In the seventh pitch of the at-bat, Halliday got Sanchez the swing at a pitch with nasty movement. Pitching to Hanley Ramirez, 
how they fell behind three and one. On the fifth pitch of the at bat, Ramirez thought he had walked and started moving towards first base, but it was a called strike two. It took six pitches to get Ramirez to ground out to Chase Utley. By the end of the inning, Howdy retired all three batters he faced, but he had thrown 19 pitches, hardly a model of consistency. In the second inning, Johnson continued to pitch well. He got Jason Worth to swing at pitches outside the strike zone and then wave at a ball to hit a very weak grounder to second. The Phillies did threaten with Juan Castro hitting a two-out double. He was followed by a broken bat single by Carlos Ruiz. Second baseman Dan Ugla actually made an amazing play getting to the ball at the back edge of the infield cutout. But the throw was a tough one for Ugla to make in that position. In the end, Roy Halladay was unable to bring the runners home, ending the inning with a strikeout. In the bottom half of the inning, Halliday continued the pattern of using a lot of pitches to get the hitters out. Jorge Cantu worked a full count, striking out on the sixth pitch of the at-bat. Likewise, it took five pitches to strike out Dan Ugla, who swung at a nasty curveball. The Marlins broadcaster seemed to express glee that if the pattern continued, it could mean a short day for Halliday. So the, the pitch count is getting up there, and that's good news because if that pitch count gets a little too high, he may have to come out of the game. Cody Ross then swung at the first pitch to ground out. Halliday threw 12 pitches in the second inning for a total of 31 pitches so far. The Phillies finally got on the scoreboard in the top of the third inning. Johnson began the inning strong, with Shane Victorino flying out to short center field. But with one out, Wilson Valdez got his second hit of the day, a single. Chase Utley then hit a long fly ball to center field. It was just over Cameron Mabin's head and bounced off the top of his glove. As the ball bounced behind Mabin, Valdez scored, and Utley reached third. It was a three-base error. In fact, it was the 40th error for the Marlins on the season. The Marlins led the league at that point. Ryan Howard was at the peak of his effectiveness as a power hitter. The Marlins chose to give him an intentional pass. Tommy Hutton explained what he thought the strategy was. They'll take a shot at a ground ball and try to get out of the inning. But Chris Wheeler had an alternative point of view. Well, the reason they walked Ryan Howard right there is he's trying to get a strikeout and prevent a fly ball and figure Josh Johnson's chances of strikeout worth are better than, uh, than to strike out Ryan Howard. I mean, that's the only reason why you would do that. And the other reason is you're playing to the opposition's pitcher right now, Roy Halladay. So you, you're doing everything you can not to give up runs. Chris Wheeler turned out to have the more accurate assessment seeing as Jason Worth proceeded to strike out. Had Howard been able to hit a deep fly ball, Utley could have tagged up and scored. As it stood with Raul Banez striking out to end the inning, the Phillies had only scored one run, and it was an unearned run at that. Roy Halladay became more efficient in the third inning. Brett Hayes popped up to chase Utley on the second pitch of his at bat, and Cameron Mabin Flied out to Shane Victorino, also on the second pitch. Although Victorino and Jason Worth barely missed a collision going after the ball. Another reminder of how precarious a perfect game can be. A matter of inches on that play preserved Halliday's gem. The inning ended when Halliday struck out his opposition, Josh Johnson. When he returned to the mound, Johnson settled down a bit, but Chooch got his second hit of the day, another single. Halliday attempted to move him up with a bunt, but struck out in the process. Victorino flied out to the third baseman, just in foul territory. 
The fans in Miami were being treated to an incredible pitcher's duel, with neither team's offense able to mount much of an attack. Halliday gained a better grip over his pitch count, although Hanley Ramirez had an issue with the pitch called strike three to end the fourth. It was the second time that Ramirez outwardly showed disagreement with the umpire's call. But as Halliday continued to mow down the Marlins in order, Johnson would answer by keeping the Phillies from scoring any more runs. The most excitement from the top of the fifth was a long fly ball hit by Ryan Howard to left field. But Chris Coughlin caught it for the out. Holiday's pitch count had stabilized. After retiring two batters in the sixth, it was clear that Johnson, who had given up a number of hits, had surpassed Halliday in pitches thrown. Still, Johnson kept the Phillies from scoring any more runs, even if he gave up the occasional hit. And while Halliday continued to pitch well, he did get help from exceptional fielding from the Phillies' defense. By the seventh inning, with the Marlins down by a run, even though Johnson continued to pitch well, the Marlins started warming up pitchers in the bullpen. And while Johnson gave up yet another hit, this time to Shane Victorino, he was immediately erased on an inning-ending double play. In the bottom of the seventh, Halliday continued to show his dominance, first by striking out Coughlin, and despite the fact that Josh Johnson had not given up an earned run, Clay Hensley was getting ready to replace him in the bullpen. After Gabby Sanchez flied out to left center, Ramirez again worked a full count, and once again, he showed his displeasure when he was rung up on strikes instead of being awarded a walk. By the end of seven innings, Josh Johnson had given up seven hits, but not a single earned run. The only blight on his day was the error in the third inning. It was just that despite the strong performance by Johnson, Halliday was, well, perfect. Through seven, Halliday had thrown 92 pitches and struck out seven. In the eighth inning, Clay Hensley replaced Johnson, and he picked up where Johnson had left off. Utley hit a ball to deep center, but it was caught near the warning track. Howard then struck out, and Jason Worth flied out. But Roy Halliday continued to put on a clinic. He got Kansu to ground out, struck out Ugla, and then Wilson Valdez caught a Cody Ross fly ball to short left field. The fact is, with the Marlins matching Halliday in terms of keeping the Phillies from scoring, Halliday almost had to be perfect. The Phillies had scored only one run in the entire game, and that was due to a costly error. This meant that Roy Halliday himself had no margin for error. In a way, Halliday had to be perfect, and Halliday responded to that challenge. In the top of the ninth, Juan Carlos Oveda came in in relief. He retired the Phillies in order. So even though Roy Halliday was working on a perfect game, the fact remained 
that this game was within reach for the Marlins. It was a one-run game. The Marlins had no reason to roll over and die. Mike Lamb came in as a pinch hitter in the top of the ninth. He hit a fly ball to deep center field. Shane Victorino ran all the way back to the warning track before catching it for the first out. The long fly ball was somewhat reminiscent of Halliday's first attempt at pitching a no-hitter. As a September call-up for Toronto, Halliday had brought a no-hitter into the ninth inning, only to lose it on a home run. To bat for Cameron Mabin, the Marlins sent in journeyman pinch hitter and former Philly, Wes Helms. Helms struck out looking. The pitcher's spot came up. It was to be the 27th batter that Halliday had faced in nine innings. This was it. If Halliday could get this batter out, he would have retired 27 batters in a row with no one reaching base. Not just a no-hitter, but a rare perfect game. The Marlins sent in pinch hitter Ronnie Paulino. If Halliday wanted that perfect game, he was still going to have to earn it. On the fourth pitch of the at-bat, the 115th pitch of the day for Halliday, Paulino hit a weak ground ball to Wilson Valdez. Valdez fielded it and threw it the first. And with that final out, Halliday hadn't done it. He had thrown a perfect game. It was only the second perfect game in Philly's history. It was the 20th in Major League history. It was also the first of Carlos Ruiz's record four no-hitters that he'd caught in his career, a mark he shares with Jason Veritek. By the end of the day, the Phillies stood in first place with a game and a half lead over Atlanta. By the end of the season, the Phillies would have 97 wins and a six game lead over Atlanta. He would top off the season with only the second no hitter ever thrown in the postseason. And in the following year, Halliday would be part of the so called Four Aces, a Phillies pitching staff that included Halliday, Cliff Lee, Cole Hamels, and Roy Oswald, any of whom could be the ace of the staff if they had played on separate teams. That team set the Phillies record for the most wins in the regular season. Roy Halladay was voted into the Hall of Fame as part of the class of 2019. It was his first year of eligibility and he garnered over 85% of the vote. His widow, Brandy, gave an emotional speech on the day of his induction. In a class move, Brandy and her two sons requested that Roy's plaque have no logo on his cap as they could not choose between the two organizations that Roy had played for. Brandy stated that she hoped her husband represented something to all Major League Baseball fans. The Phillies were set to retire Roy's number 34 in the 2020 season. In fact, Bryce Harper, who wore 34 with the Washington Nationals, chose to wear number three in Philadelphia, asserting that no Philly other than Roy Halladay should ever wear 34 again. Unfortunately, the delay in the start of the 2020 season and then the season without fans caused the Phillies to postpone Roy Halladay's number retirement ceremony. Should fans return to the Major League Stadiums in 2021, I'm sure that one of the most anticipated events will be when the Phillies are finally able to retire Roy Halladay's number in front of Philadelphia fans. Next week, we will once again return to lists, counting down the top catchers in Phillies history. Feel free to comment on your favorite Phillies catcher and why. Click here for the story of Roy Halladay's postseason no-hitter. Check out our description box for our merchandise store and how you can help us bring more of these types of videos to YouTube. Thank you for watching.